Hello, hello, and welcome to Temple of the False Spot, where our decks are not optimized, but our plays sure as heck are fun. As you can tell, I am well caffeinated and have my coffee ready. Excellent. Hi, I'm Andy. Hi, I'm Bruce. And uh, today we are talking about a very special deck to me, even though it's Bruce's. Uh, Bruce brought for show and tell uh, my very first EDH deck, the, the very first one I played. Uh, it's his. It is Nissa Vastwood Seer. Yeah, and the treat with Nissa. Um, okay, so this is we're gonna go way old school. Um, Nissa the Vastwood Seer. This is not the first time that I've talked about this deck on a on a <laughs> podcast slash uh, uh, video. Yeah, um, I did this ages ago when I was at my first Gen Con. Whoa. Um, we had a chance to uh, a chance to talk about the deck then, um, and anybody who takes a look at this list will probably realize that there have not been a <laughs> lot of changes to this list. I have made a few, um, but not a lot. It turns out when the deck just does what you want it to do, you you don't really want to change it. Yeah, like, this is um, this is a relatively straightforward deck. Uh, play some land. And then play out your commander, and then play more land, and just keep playing more land. That's really where you want to be with this deck. And uh, because of that, it's a great deck for uh, for players who are new to commander, because you get to do big splashy things, and it it encourages you to just play out your hand as much as you can all the time. You just want to be moving things along. And that's great when you're looking to teach somebody how to play, uh, you know, or when somebody's first getting into Commander, so. Yeah, I mean, this, like, definitely, I mean, obviously was a great uh, stepping stone for me. Um, so, for those who don't know, Nissa Vastwood Seer is two and a green. Legendary creature Elf Scout. She's a 2-2. Two -two. When Nissa Vastwood Seer enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a basic forest card, reveal it, Put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. When a land enters the battlefield under your control, if you have, uh, if you control seven or more lands, exile Nissa, then return her to the battlefield transformed under her owner's control. Um, and so she transforms into Nissa Sage Animist, which is a planeswalker uh, with three loyalty, plus one. Reveal the top card of your library if it's a land card put onto the battlefield. Otherwise, put it in your hand. Minus two. Put a legendary 4-4 green elemental creature token named Ashaya, the Awoken World, onto the battlefield. And her ultimate, minus seven. Untap up to six target lands. They become 6-6 six, six elemental creatures. They are still lands. I will say, Andy was good enough to read out all three abilities on the Planeswalker side of the card. But to be blunt... You're only ever using the first one. I can think of a handful of times when I've actually created the Ashaya token because I needed a creature. Um, but for the most part, you're using the first ability. Uh, this commander is in there to draw cards, and that's what the first ability does. And it only and it only adds to your to your land count as well. So it's always I almost always go with the first one. Uh, I don't think I have ever actually used the ultimate ability on the card um, in all the games I've played. <laughs> mostly because as soon as you make your land into creatures, now people tend to have ways to get rid of the land. Um, so if I'm not uh, if I'm not looking to finish this thing immediately with that with the ultimate, then um, I'm just not going to do it. So yeah. Um... And before we move on, that video you were talking about. I'll put the link in the description. Obviously, um, Nyssa has had many iterations um, as a character uh, since Magic Origins. Is that when this was? Yeah. Um, but this is like the one that you can actually make a commander, which is nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, right. So where where do you want to start? Where do you want to start with this deck? Um well, let's start with uh, let's start with the ramp package. Um, for those of you who can see the deck, the deck list, uh, the ramp package is massive. It's massive. 
Um, if you can think of a card in green that ramps, there is a very good chance it's already in this deck. <laughs> um, I've got all of the all of the basics that you would expect: the cultivate Kodama's Reach, Harrow, um, along with a lot of creatures who who will let you get land because I do want at least some creatures in the early going to, you know to park in front of my uh, my battlefield so that I'm not taking constant hits early on. Um, you'll also want them there as uh, some sort of as blocking fodder for when Nissa becomes a planeswalker. But um, given that the deck uh, uh, the deck really wants to see two lands, at least two lands get dropped almost every turn. Uh, there are a lot of cards in here that have landfall or get some kind of benefit based on the volume of lands or how often you're drop or just how often you're dropping them. I got a number of cards in here that are essentially landfall that just aren't called landfall. So you want to you want to hit that as often as possible. So you want your natural land drop every turn, and you also want something else, which is why there's so much ramp in the deck. So yeah, and I mean. Um... If you if you look at it, if you look at this deck list, it is the the epitome of of green smash, uh, oh, ra- yeah. ramp and smash uh, from twenty fifteen. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, it. I mean, like I said, this was the deck that I learned how to play commander. Uh, for those who don't know. Um, Bruce and I met each other through uh, a job that we were working, um, and he found out that I was also very nerdy, asked me if I've ever played Magic. I was like, ah, once or twice. And uh, so during lunch, he would bring in some decks. Uh, eventually, we upgraded to Commander decks, would take extended lunches, <laughs> and uh, play some Magic. Uh, this was my very first <clears throat> commander deck that i ever played with and uh really got me into loving everything that green does uh surprisingly it took me three years to build a deck that had green (laughs) in it uh so maybe i'm not as much of a green player as i thought i was but uh it i mean it does the things um yeah i mean like you said as a huge ramp package but i think more than that like you've got you know the essential landfall cards in Avengers of Zendikar, Rampage, Rampaging Baloths, uh, where you let those resolve and you essentially have the game on lock. Um, right, and it it goes even like I mean, you know, Rampaging Baloth, Baloth, and uh, Avengers of Zendikar, the two obvious ones. Um, I even went a little a little unusual. I mean, Beru Fist of Krosa is not something you're going to find in most <laughs> decks. But the idea that, uh, I mean, you're giving... Where is it here? I'll read it off. Uh, whenever a forest comes into play, green creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and gain trample until the end of the turn. Uh, so, in theory, if this is out, every single turn I'm going to be dropping at least one forest. So I should be able to give all of my cre- creatures trample every single turn um, as well as at least plus one plus one sometimes more and the deck does have a a package of uh, token creators uh, x spells that create a lot of tokens uh, and obviously avenger of zendikar does that as well so it's sort of ways to pad that along um, there's uh yeah i mean dungrove elders another one and uh buduku gardener yeah buduku gardener that flips and or doesn't really flip. I think it flips. I forget the term. Is it flip? Yeah, it says on the card. Um, yeah. I I remember looking into this card for our barbecue episode. Okay. And I was like, these these ones flip. flip. Nissa transforms. Ah, well, there we go. So it flips into uh, Dokai Weaver of Life, and you can put an XX green elemental creature token to play where X is the number of lands you control. So obviously you can get some massive dudes. Um, so... And, you know, even another card like Howl of the Night Pack, which is, you know, fairly handy when you're looking at a deck that runs uh, 40 lands and so it would be 36 36 forests. Yeah. Um, I obviously don't run a lot of non-basics in this one. There just isn't a lot of point. But, um, 
So it just, and it kind of runs from there. I mean, once you realize that you've got some monster cards that only get stronger and stronger every time you drop another forest onto the battlefield, uh, you just want to get as many out as you can. So Yeah. I mean, you're, uh, you've got some pretty, pretty big payoffs uh, with some X spells. Um, I can see from this angle, three, four, four. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, some of the other spells, it goes, it, they're not X spells, but they might as well be. I mean, mm-hmm. scavenging ooze only requires one green mana, but you can empty a, you can empty a graveyard in the late game if you're willing to spend, you know, if you're willing to spend 10 mana, suddenly somebody's graveyard has nothing of what they're, you know, none, none of what they wanted. Um, another card that doesn't, you know, jump right out at you is uh, Jade Mage. Uh, it's another, it's not an X spell, but it might as well be. Um, it's a one, it's only a 2-1 creature, but the ability is uh, for 2 and a green, you put a 1-1 one, one Sapperling creature token onto the battlefield. Well, you know, once you're up around... 15, 16 mana, if you're not burning it every turn, uh, the Jade Mage will certainly make sure that you're tapped out at the, before the start of your turn every single time. Because, um, you know, just padding the padding your board with, with a, a pile of Sapperling tokens is, uh, you know, is just a benefit that you might as well be taking advantage of. So, Yeah. Um, something else that kind of jumps out uh, looking at this kind of laid out like this uh your removal package uh even though you've got like some very high caustic cards like it is impressive um i initially when i started when when i set this up um most of the removal package the goal was to remove uh enchantments and artifacts um when i built the deck it they were all over the place um, and it just seemed like every single game I ran into, it was, they were just everywhere. And uh, so I, I, I think I may have overloaded with, uh, with enchantment and artifact removal. Um, and then almost incidentally added creature removal into <laughs> it. Uh, but uh, there's plenty there. And now that we're seeing, uh, you know, I feel like the, the deck has survived long enough now to see a cycle uh, where we're now returning to having a ton of artifacts and enchantments, especially oh, yeah, with our, especially our just artifact tokens mm. between food and treasure and clues. Oh my god, um, they're they're going a little bit overboard with treasure. I'm not complaining, right? And I mean, you know, a card like Bane of Progress, well, it's not going to destroy many of those. Um, you know, I mean. In theory, yeah. anybody who's got a treasure token will simply sack it in response, so you won't get any of the plus and plus encounters. But that's fine. You're forcing them to just burn it. Mm. Uh, now, maybe they'll have a way to use that mana, or maybe you're forcing them to use it at a time when they didn't want to, but it doesn't hurt. Um, between that one and uh, Wave of Vitriol was the other one. Um, this is a card that yeah, we, I haven't thought about in years. We have Vitriol is miserable for a lot of opponents, and not just because it gets rid of all the artifacts and enchantments. It also gets rid of all the non-basics. So Wave of Vitriol is five green green. It's a sorcery. And it says, each player sacrifices all artifacts, enchantments, and non-basic lands he or she controls. For each land sacrificed this way, its controller may search their library for a basic land card. Put it onto the battlefield tapped. Then each player who sh- searched their library this way shuffles it. Um, wow. Right. Now, in theory, uh, I mean, the first time I ever read it, I thought, okay. So uh, if I'm playing again, playing and somebody plays this, I'm going to lose, you know, I'm going to have to sacrifice, say, five out of my ten lands. But then I'm just going to get five basics, and I'm just going to make sure to mix and match so that I get the right color combination. So in essence, all it's doing is getting rid of all the artifacts and enchantments, and it's costing seven for that. And I thought to myself, that doesn't seem so great. And then I played a game where somebody actually played it, and I discovered that of my 16 lands, 12 were getting destroyed, and I didn't have 12 basics in my library. 
So in essence, they just destroyed a ton of my land. And I started <laughs> thinking to myself, I mean, at seven mana, you're only playing this in the mid to late, mid or late game. Yeah. There is a very real chance that a lot of your opponents are going to actually lose land in this scenario because you're going to empty they they're not running enough ba they're not running enough basics to 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 cover what they're about to lose. It's um, also a lesson to run more basics. <laughs> it is, and that's part of the reason why I have started running more basics, not wave of vitriol specifically, right. but just generally yeah. it's a good I it was a good idea for me to cut back a little. But um I really like the card and hey, it does wipe out all artifacts and enchantments, so that's that's, you know, part of it as well. Yeah. So, um, other than mono green good stuff, did you have like, like a, like a theme behind the deck? Other than that, so like obviously you've said ramp, and it like ramps right. into insanity. Uh, when I intended to, when I built it, my intention was, uh, I had just played against uh, a bunch of players who were, who were building decks that were clearly better than mine. And had a series of games where I got to eight or nine mana, and everybody else was at close to twenty. And I was just like, "Okay, so what am I doing wrong?" So I decided, fine, you know what? I'm going to play green. I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go ape on on ramp, and just let's see how much mana I get out there. <laughs> and then I and then once I once I got to that point, I, I realized, okay, well, if you're playing this much. Then let's you know you really want to lean into it. So I lean way into it. Yeah, and uh, that's sort of where we went. Now, um, like I said, there hasn't been a lot of changes. So to suggest that this deck is optimized would be comical. It's not. It it runs well, and it plays. Uh, you know, I think it it hits above its weight. Um, I think this this is the deck I tend to pull out. If I think I'm running into a group where where the power level is a little higher, um, hmm. if for no other reason than it does have a lot of mass removal, and I can get a ton of land out early and make big big plays and big swings, mm. so um, yeah, that's you're not sort of playing to win; in. you're playing to do the big thing. And I think like um, yeah, it it still has that chance at winning regardless of the play group. Um, I I still keep coming back to this. Uh, thought of like this is like especially with it kind of being like originating if you will right. from this magic origins card um it is so like perfect to have it be this who's who of uh iconic green cards at the time um, right and i think that's that's kind of the reason that i really haven't changed it a whole mm. lot um what I've come to find is that it is this deck is easily one of the uh, when somebody when somebody's looking for a deck of all of my decks this is the one that's easiest to hand to someone and say here play this because they take a look at it they look at the commander they start to play and you know your play expectations are basically already there there's no uh, it's not a commander where there's a big trick where there's a trick to it where you need to set up certain situations to make it happen like no it just keeps pouring out it is what it is it is you know it is yeah. big green big green smash and yeah. it makes no apologies for being that so. no um it seems rather straightforward too like it feels like you could go into this deck not knowing anything about it other than the commander and like anything you kind of pull off the top if you can play it you should um like obviously there's some like sequencing things because it's yeah it's interesting because i think most of the the, the most difficult sequencing issues mm -hmm. are with your land drops mm. because you want to make your land drop before you play say cultivate because when you play cultivate you've already played your land you don't get to play another <laughs> so you want to keep a lot of this stuff in order and especially, in, and it's just, it's bizarre how much time I spend figuring out when can I play my land and when should I not. Mm. Um, uh, you know, for, for almost every deck, the standard play is, 
you know, draw your card, immediately play your land. Now count up. <laughs> this is what I got. This is how I work with it. But with this deck, so many times you want to hold on to that land because... Yeah. You, you know. I mean, even with Nyssa, like when she comes in, she gets you a land. Right. Um, if you've not already played that land, your land for the turn, and she gets you... I mean, yeah. she looks for, what, the seventh? Yeah. yeah. So if you have five, she comes in, she gets you your sixth. Yeah. And then you can play your land... Which is the seventh? It flips her. Now you have essentially, I mean, right. ideally four mana to deal with. Right. Um, which is, I mean, it, it was it was perfect for for my first deck because it it taught me the value of sequencing without hitting me over the head with it. Right. And to be fair, if somebody else is playing it and they're not comfortable with the sequencing. It just means it's running just a little slower. Mm. It this isn't you know it isn't like oh you mess up the sequencing you don't get to do this amazing thing. It's mm. no no you're still going to get to it's just going to take a little bit longer, and you know so it's it's fairly forgiving that way. But again, the sequencing with the land quite often is the most you know is one of your your most difficult questions with this deck. It really is just play it out go 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 so. Yeah. I want to say, the last time I played this deck, it was either Beacon of Creation or Avenger of Zendikar. Mm -hmm. um, I played, and I already had doubling season out, so I ended up with, I think it was like 50 tokens, and I was so excited. Uh, even though I didn't have those tokens the next turn, because somebody wiped the board. Right. Uh, with good reason. Yeah. Um, it's just like, it... Everything you do turns into a big play, and it's so good. Well, and this is kind of the this is the beautiful part with this deck. You know, you play Beacon of Creation, create. You know, you've got twenty five lands out. You get fifty with the doubling season, okay. And then someone destroys all the lands. Fine, because there's a real good chance that on the next turn, you've got something else that can recover. You know, that can do another big play. And do something else that, you know, will yeah. do it all over again. Maybe it's, you know, maybe you do have Avengers Zendikar. Maybe it's run Praetor's Council, uh, you know, and pull it back. Mm. Um, there's there's all sorts of uh, all sorts of ways. That, I mean, the deck recovers really well from from mass removal. Uh, so, you know, you just sort of keep rolling along that way. Yeah. Um... I've got a few more questions for you, but let's go to break real sure. quick. Uh, we're about halfway point, so we'll be right back. Um, enjoy this lovely message from our sponsor. This episode of Temple of the False Pod is brought to you by your very own Sakura Tribe Builder. Now, Steve may be old, but he has his uses. Well, if he runs out of those uses, sacrifice him, and you get more value. Sakura Tribe Elder. Sakura Tribe Elder. It's a staple for a reason. Use him. Now back to you. Wow! Alright. That was spectacular. Welcome back. Um, so, we're here with Bruce. Uh, special guest Bruce. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, <laughs> uh, and his Nissa deck uh, that hasn't been changed in six years, uh, except for End Raise Four Runners, which came out in twenty nineteen. Could be. It was um, uh, Ravnica Guilds of Ravnica, Ravnica Allegiance, Ravnica Allegiance. So the that block. Yeah, uh, the Four Runners made the deck mostly because. When I built the deck, I didn't have Creator Hoof Behemoth, and just decided I should have at least something that can give all of the creatures trample and some kind of benefit. Yeah. And hey, plus uh, two, plus two, Vig, Vig and trample, uh, not a bad. And gives this seven seven Vig trample and haste. I mean, yeah. So I mean, you drop it. You're you know swinging in. Swing it in for seven with just that creature, and ideally, you've probably got a significant number of tokens or other creatures that are going in as well. Yeah, and I mean, it's not 
it's not optimal uh but uh also it's not crater hoof at fifty dollars exactly (laughs) so okay fine it's not optimal but uh whatever yeah i mean um so i had a few questions for you you bet um some of them are uh not to do with this deck uh what's your foot size no um uh this was not your first edh deck correct no it was not my first edh deck. by by any means i no. mean this nissa herself came out in 2015 what was your first edh deck oh boy um either played or built i think it's vorel at least that's the that's the one that's coming to mind. I could be wrong. Okay. Um, but I think Varel was the first, uh, the first commander deck I built. Um, it, it's been you know, so yeah, it it it's been a good long while. Gotta yeah, gotta love yeah. that green and counters. I guess. I mean, oh, green uh, blue. I mean, you know, yeah. I, I I think I started in the right place. Yeah. <laughs> Or wrong place, depending on how you well, want to look at I it. I mean, green and blue are the the two colors that I went to the, the latest. But you know, right to each their own, uh, which is so surprising. I mean, with this being the first deck, and I enjoyed it so much, I uh, I don't know why I didn't build green sooner. Um, maybe just because it's too easy, Bruce. Well, nowadays it's too easy. It yeah, I mean, especially green and blue, <laughs> right. Um, this one was, I was trying to build a number of decks that were monocolored. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, I mean, I just, I wanted a ramp package in a deck mm-hmm. that would, you know, ensure that the deck saw a ton of mana. Um, because that hasn't, that, it's not always the case in a lot of my decks, although I have made better efforts lately. So with such a solid base, um, have you th- like i mean i'm sure you've thought of about it but have you like seriously considered updating it um yes and no uh it it always just seems to be like the since it's mostly just a good stuff mm-hmm. um you can you know in theory i could be updating it every single set with whatever the best green card is. the good the good green stuff is for that particular deck yeah. set um so because it doesn't have a specific theme, mm-hmm. you don't always think about it when you see the other when you see other cards. Right. You know. Uh in when new sets come out, uh I think, you know, if I see something that says something about the bottom of the library, well that immediately clicks with with Grenzo Dungeon Master, uh, Dungeon Warden. Uh so, you know, that that deck clicks that way. And then there are other decks that, you know, you see particular cards that fit with that deck and that makes sense. But with this with uh, with Nissa, it just hasn't been a deck that's uh, that's drawn a lot of attention. I mean, uh, or that draws me to to look at the new cards in every set. Um, uh, just for the uh, for the audience, we've got the whole deck laid out on a play mat here. So um, it's uh, it's a great way to to look at it and see the. Uh, uh, see the faults of the deck so um you know seeing it like this yeah there's there are there are plenty of changes that i would that i would like and probably should make to the deck so yeah um i think that it like it does some like real interesting things um it's interesting when you get a deck that has stayed together as long as this one has then you start to run into things in the deck that you didn't you really never recognized mm. or didn't think it would ever actually play out. Uh, I mean, one of the cards in the deck is Creeper Hulk. Uh, Creeper Hulk doesn't seem like a whole lot. It's a five mana for five, five, and it's a trample. And it's like, okay, that's great. And then it says for one and a green until the end of the turn, target creature you control has power and toughness of five, five and gains trample. And, you know, you look at that and, you know, your immediate thought is, okay, so, you know, ooh, how great is this going to be on my Eternal Witness or on an Acidic Slime? Because now it has Death Touch and it's a 5-5. Five, five, and that'll be fun and interesting. And then you stop and realize you're running a deck that pumps out 20 mana. <laughs> and you think, I can activate this more than once. And suddenly those uh, uh, 
the insect tokens coming off of the Hornet Queen are no longer one ones. There's a series of five five that are five five flyers. And you can do this at any time. So you can do this during when somebody attacks you and they think that they're going to get away with, you know, <laughs> wiping out a bunch of tokens. Or you can do this on your attack when you swing in and find out who they're blocking and who they're not and making your choices then. Um, it does all kinds of weird stuff, which is not something I really even thought of when I put the deck, when I put Creeper Hulk in. I thought, okay, well, this will be nice. You know, hey, maybe I can pump up Nyssa when she's a creature just to protect her. So, um, so these cards that end up doing more things than you realize when, you know, just because the deck has been together for that long. Yeah. Especially where like, I mean, as specifically Creeper Hulk, like because it's base five, five, uh, anything that has tokens on it or anything that has counters on it, the counters are then added after the five, five. So right. it's like, it's real, real supreme. Yeah. Uh, your two, two scavenging news is now. Five five with a couple of five five ones. with however many tokens is, are, are counters or counters. Why do I keep saying top. tokens? Yeah. Um, so I know you have for for mono. I feel like mono colored decks get yeah. like a bad rap because like you could be doing more with it, and it's like sure. Uh, this this is a deck. If you took out the commander and replaced the commander with a green whatever, you could take out. A chunk of the ramp, mm -hmm. you know, a chunk of the, uh, some of the big, you know, some of the big hitters. The payoffs, yeah. And take advantage of what's available in another color. Because most of the ramp doesn't say get a forest. Most of the ramp just says get a basic land. So if you can get a basic land, you can get another color. You could easily make this into a two-color deck. Um, maybe it wouldn't be quite so ramp-focused, but you could definitely... Do turn it into a two color option and have all sorts of other things but yeah i wanted it to be one color i yeah. wanted it to be monocolor. i think yeah i think monocolor decks like deserve more recognition if only like because they are so straightforward like you have more like room to weirdly enough like you're less restricted because you're doing one thing um, like like you said, if yeah. you were to run another color, you'd have to cut out some of the ramp, cut out some of the big things. Um, part but, of the yeah, and part of the problem is, I'd have to cut out some of the funky cards. Yeah. So if this was a two color deck from the start, I would never have realized what what Creeper Hulk can do <laughs> because it would never have made the deck. Right. Um. You know there are, and I mean there are other cards in this deck that really in the greater scheme of things probably shouldn't be there i mean you mentioned wood elves there's you know there are a handful of cards that really haven't done quite what i wanted quite what i thought they would do or what i wanted them to do and yeah. others that you know still haven't had that opportunity yet for me to play it out and really see what it can you know how it can really go so yeah um you know when you're playing monocolored you get a little more flexibility as far as what you can throw in there just because yeah, there are more. There are a few more restrictions. So you've got Nissa. Yeah. Do you have? I can think of one other one. Do you have more monocolored decks? Uh, I have uh, Kalidus, Trader of Get. Okay, that's um, the one I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah. mono black. Um, I had. Oh, I thought I had a mono red deck, but now that I say it, I can't think of the commander. <laughs> um, I also used to have a mono red yes. deck. Now I don't, but. Uh, um, yeah, because I've been meaning to to build more mono colored decks. Like I've got a mono black Drana Liberator of Malakir deck that it was my I think my second deck that I ever made, um, and then like it's good. It's just it never gets played anymore. And I think that if I rebuilt it into something else, like right. traded in some of those pieces for bigger and better things, I think. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I also played mono blue, uh, but that was only ever online. Mm. Um, there was, a, it, I mean, I say mono blue. It was primarily artifact, but <laughs> blue brown. Uh, yeah. Do you do you have plans for another mono colored deck? If not mono green, like if you were to keep this one together uh, and not update it, would you then do just a different deck? Or uh, well, the next the next option 
mm-hmm. uh, I think is probably mono white, mm-hmm. um, just because I'd like to go that route. Mm. Um, I'm a I'm a fan of white cards. They're uh, getting better every day. And well, we had a we had an entire podcast talking about white cards and how I don't believe they're quite as bad as everybody believes they were in the first place. So I believe it's our most popular episode of yet. Right. So. And so you add that or add in all of the recent upgrades that that white has been getting and I think you can comfortably build a, a mono white deck that'll battle well. Yeah. With uh, as far as mono green, unless I can come up with another uh, another angle, mm-hmm. then probably not. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if anything, the updates for this deck would probably be would probably end up angling it more towards uh, more towards uh, counter and token production. Mm. Unfortunately, I, I do that <laughs> yeah. all the time. Yeah, uh, and. I don't really want to make this another another situation where I'm pulling out erasable markers and making more token creatures. Um, yeah, it's funny. I uh, my my Mimeoplasm deck is starting to turn into like a Hydra slash Ooze deck, which ends up right. just doing more and more plus one plus one counters, and uh, not ideal for a, a deck that wants to pull things out of the graveyard. You know, right? Uh, you get a zero zero. Mm-hmm. Or you get no additional plus one plus one counters. Uh, so I need to halt that in its tracks. But uh, I feel like I, I feel that that green pull of wanting to do plus one plus one counters. Uh, it's it's strong. It's strong. Yeah, it's uh, just a lot of fun to put dice on things. I mean, you know, for a guy who's had. Four copies of Doubling Season, four copies of Primal Vigor, four copies of virtually every green card that allows you to make twice the tokens or double the counters. Mm. Um, we get it, Bruce. You've been playing for a while. It's oh, uh, it's something that I go back to again and again just because it's fun, mm. I, or I I enjoy doing it. But um, no, you're not wrong. It's fun. This, it is, uh, right. This deck just doesn't... Uh, I don't want this one to be another deck that does that. I already have a handful of uh, green X decks that make tokens. And honestly, I've got a lot of non-green decks that make a pile of tokens as well. Yeah, it's so, objectively fun. You can ask I, anyone. I, I think so. I'm not going to argue with you on this point. Uh, but uh, this, is a, this is a deck that, doesn't, that shouldn't go down that route. I think I want to find another way. Um, I will say that uh, right now I feel like the biggest weakness of the deck is a lack of true win conditions. You this, know what this deck needs? What is this deck thing? Sylvan Awakening. Unless it's already in here. Uh, no, I don't have Sylvan Awakening. I have Sylvan Offering, which is a, a far a far weaker cousin of Sylvan <laughs> Awakening. Uh, I like so, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there are plenty of times when this deck gets up, you know, you hit that 20 landmark or 20 plus lands. And at that point, it's like, okay, time to finish. Let's make it count. And you start to run out of things to do with your mana. Um, you know, sure. Jade Mage is great. But again, a ton of 1-1 Sapperlings is they can't quite finish by themselves. Mm. You know, 20 one, one creatures are great, but they're still not going to do the 40 damage you need to kill. Yeah. So, Or even uh, if you dump it into, like, say, something like Primordial Hydra. Like, right. one, it doesn't have Trample. Uh, yeah. Two, it's a creature. Right. With that many plus one, plus one counters on it. So it's like, it, it, you could potentially win the game by killing one person, and then next turn, one person. And then the next turn, one person. And that's what this deck asks you to do. Um, but if you do it that way, invariably somebody's going to wipe wipe your board <laughs> and swoop in while you're defenseless. For they don't need moment. to wipe your board; they just need to. <laughs> they just need to get in. <laughs> Use murder, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's just okay, uh, you know. And that gets frustrating um, because there's been a number of games where I feel like I'm on the brink and I'm ready to win. And four turns go by, and you just can't get it done. Uh, and 
So uh, that's the deck's weakness, and if I make any alterations to it, that's where it has to happen. Helix Pinnacle. Helix Pinnacle is certainly an option. <laughs> <laughs> it's always an option. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, just more big stuff. Um, you know, more more expansive plays. Uh, you know, when you when you make some of these big plays. Like Genesis Wave. Genesis Wave is great. And when you've got, you know, 20 mana and you're willing to make X15, um, you should be finishing the game. If you don't finish it that turn, yeah. you should finish it the next turn. And the problem with Genesis Wave is it demonstrates just how much uh, I can draw cards. It's the card quality. Uh, yeah. There are too many, too many cards that are all set up. And they're just not, not enough finish. Yeah, you know, you you have the consistency of getting to where you need to be. You ramp into. Yeah, the early and mid game nothing. with this deck are great. Mm. It's the end game. It's the finish. It's very threatening. It's all bark no bite. Well, and that's the other part of the problem. Um, you know, once you start pumping out that much land, people expect big spells to go with it. Um, and then you start drawing more and more attention. And this deck deals reasonably well with the attention it draws, but it just doesn't finish. I mean, you can only stop somebody from doing something so many times, but it's, at some point, they're going to get through if you never actually stop them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if, if you're just stopping what they're doing over and over again, at some point, they're just going to bust through. Um, so yeah, this uh, this deck I think it needs a little more, a little more finish. So don't they all? <laughs> yeah, but so. I mean that's that's kind of the thing with EDH in general, especially with our our oeuvre of building decks is that right. I mean they're never finished, uh, and they're definitely not optimal. Right, and honestly. If I could get that to this, if I could get the kind of finish that I'm looking to get with this deck, then I think that's when you start, you know, I think this deck would start rating, would be worth like an eight or a nine. Whoa. Um, right now, I think it's barely a seven. I would say it's a, you know, I'd say it's a five. I mean, I hate, I hate the numbering on that. Yeah. But it's just, it doesn't have the finish. I think as long it, as you don't have yeah. to finish, then you're just not, you know, you're not going to pull out a lot of wins. I think with like this this movement away from like a like a tier system, yeah, uh, I think that this deck would ideally win on turn eight or nine. Um, yeah, like it's 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 good, but as we've talked about, there's no finish. Yeah. But speaking of finish, yes, I think we gotta wrap up this episode. All right, yeah, Good very segue. nice. Very nice. Um, so that's gonna do it for us for this week. Um, reach us, reach out to us on Twitter at FalsePodMTG. Tell us your favorite mono green card. Um, give or, me some finishing options. <laughs> give him some finishing options, uh, and we'll be we'll be back uh, next week. <laughs> uh, <laughs> With another exciting episode of Temple of the False Pod, where our decks are not optimized, but our plays sure as heck are fun. I'm Andy. I'm Bruce. Uh, have a great night, and may your fifth land be the temple. Bye! <laughs> you gotta do it higher. Higher? Bye! Bye! There you go. <laughs>Hey everyone, Andy here. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Temple of the False Pod. Just a few housekeeping things here at the end of the show. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, uh, pretty much wherever you can find podcasts. Subscribe and give us a review. It really helps out the show. And it'll show us what you like about our podcast. Uh, also, we've got a Twitter and an Instagram. Our handle is falsepodmtg, all one word. So be sure to follow us. Feel free to reach out to us there or drop us an email at falsepodmtg at gmail.com and tell us your favorite magic-related story. We'd love to hear from you. 
Thank you again to you and to Bruce. He's Mana Burned on Twitter, and I'm Andy Weekend on Twitter and Twitch. We're Temple of the False Pod, where our decks aren't optimized, but our plays sure as heck are fun. Have a great night, and may your fifth land be the temple.